Welcome to week four of doing church in this new virtual reality. Things keep changing, some good. Actually, much of it is still actually scary and very bad. And so today in this new unfolding moment, as we keep choosing faith that is informed trust in the middle of fear, I welcome all of you again to Sanctus Church in this Easter season. No matter if you've been a Christian for years, just become a Christian, if you're a seeker or skeptic, spiritual or not, in this time of crisis, come and hear the words of hope, words of healing, and words of life. I was reflecting on this, the words of Jesus, the story of Jesus I'm going to preach from today because this was actually also chosen months ago. And as I was writing this, now it seems to have even more impact that since we now understand our mortality and because of the sickness we're seeing all around us and our full reliance on doctors and nurses when our bodies cannot heal themselves. Jesus in the book of Mark said this, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Literally, the whole world has been talking and texting and tweeting about sickness and medical help. And as I shared last week, more and more of us are starting to know people directly affected by the virus. Most of us are feeling so very lost in one degree or another. Much of what we relied upon and trusted in has changed or is gone in literally four or five weeks. And then the world, of course, is being forced to stay home or find a home, and many have lost jobs. And so in this time of lostness, in this time of shuddering and shutting down, we come again to the words of Jesus and find the true state of ourselves and maybe Just maybe the silver lining in this global crisis is that we who are Christians would truly see and experience our faith in a much deeper, authentic way, knowing the hope we have. And for many others of you, you would encounter Jesus for the first time who always gives hope and life and eternal life that lasts in the now, in the not yet, that ripples into eternity in any season Now, in this Easter time, which we are in, let us all remember that the original story of Easter and the season of Easter has always been a mix of darkness and light, hopelessness and hope, betrayal and rescue, being lost and being found. Now, our scene today opens uh, before the Easter moment, and it actually is taking place in an environment we're not allowed to go to anymore. It's taking place at a big party got a Bible, I'd love you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. We'll be in Luke 15 to start, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now it doesn't sound like very much other than a party going on, but 2,000 years ago this was a bombshell within Jewish culture, within the day of Jesus. This was a list of retrobates, uh, the good for nothings, the villains in the story, the wicked and, and the wretched. But now here is the irony. It is those people, the wrong people, the lost people that are looking to be near Jesus the most. And why? Because they know they're lost because they know they're so very uh, lost. And unlike many others who don't think they are lost or don't need to find a way home, they're desperate to be found and they're desperate actually to find a home, but they're not even sure if there's an option for them to be found and get a home. They actually are the ones who know they're sick and, and, and they're not sure if there is a cure. And if there is a cure, they're not even sure if anyone would be willing to give it to them. The first in the list is the tax collectors. I've shared this before in our own church. Tax tax collectors to us don't sound that bad. I mean, no one likes losing money towards taxes, but so much more is taking place here. See, at this time, they were Jewish middlemen between Jews and the Roman occupational government. They were one of the most hated classes within Jewish society. They were dishonest and considered betrayers of family and faith and friend and country. The average Jew of that day viewed them as a sold out dangerous person. It's like during World War II as an example when the Japanese occupied much of China or or the Germans occupied of course much of Europe. Those who worked with those occupational forces were called collaborators. That's exactly what the tax collectors were 2,000 years ago. Another one outlines it like this. To Jews listening, a toll collector was the worst kind of crook. 
Not unlike a mafia extortionist working for the Roman government, collecting money from his fellow Jews and keeping whatever he could exact on top, which he pledged to collect. For years, they lived well, skimming off the top of what they were paying to Rome. These collectors were a low-level sort, despised, vulnerable to the hatred of farmers and merchants, powerless and without honor. And because they dealt with non-Jews, they were considered spiritually unclean. If you chose to become a tax collector, three things happened to you immediately. Uh, number one, you could never be a judge or witness in a court case ever because you were dis- considered that dishonest. Number two, you were immediately excommunicated from the synagogue. That is, you were kicked out of church because you decided to go against the God of your people. And third, you became immediately a disgrace to your family, immediate and extended, and sometimes kicked out of your family. But not just tax collectors. Then it says that Jesus was eating at a party with tax collectors and sinners. Now that seems like a pretty broad term. So who are the sinners? Well, to the Orthodox Jewish mind, sinner has two definitions. First, those who are living an outright moral breakdown, sin. They're stealing and lying and they're worshiping idols or they're doing all the sexual stuff the Bible says no to, like adultery and fornication, that word porneia we've talked about, or, or, or murder, that they, they are sinning. Then there's another definition of sin, and both are implied here. You have the original laws of God, which all humans may never break, that sin. And then at this time, there was a group of oral laws or man-made laws that were religious to sort of stop you, putting up fences to stop you from breaking God's original laws. And so if you actually broke God's laws and also the religious laws on top of those, you were also considered a sinner. So if you didn't meet up, meet with the standards of the time. So the religious leaders were profoundly upset because they taught spirit spiritual purity was connected to association. So if you ate or took time or lived with people that were not following God's standards and the other religious standards of the day, you actually were saying that that lifestyle or that that way of living was okay and they taught you would be tainted spiritually in God's eyes. Like a cold, like the flu, what we're literally living through right now, like the pandemic we're going through, the pastors would say, if you did not spiritually socially distance or isolate or quarantine yourself from these sinners, you would spiritually get sick. You would become dangerous to other people by being with the wrong people. In other words, God would view you as contaminated. So Jesus is having dinner with all the wrong people, getting spiritually sick, and that's what the pastors were saying. And if you're around these people, you'll become like these people, and you also will be cut off. So so they were saying, so Jesus, don't just wash your hands. Don't just wear the mask. Don't just socially distance yourself. Don't be near those spiritually contaminated people, or you yourself will become contaminated and will need to be cut off. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, verse 2, muttered, this man welcomes sinners and is eating with them. Did you catch it? Jesus is not just eating with these contaminated people. He welcomes them. He says, I want to have dinner with you. I want to have coffee with you. But the others are very upset. The Pharisees are like, this guy is out of control. He thinks he reps God, but his actions speak louder than his words and even his miracles. We should not trust him. Now, maybe you've not done church at all, and you're like, well, who's a Pharisee? Well, well, the name literally means a separated one. If you have church background, you know a little bit more. But we, without thinking in church culture, think of Pharisees as the villain or the sinner or the one always opposing Jesus. But we've got a lot of this wrong at so many levels. Pharisees were the most popular spiritual leaders in their day, hanging out with everyday people, trying to help them understand God's word in practical ways. They helped the poor. They were pillars in their community. And so they were profoundly sincere followers of God, but in this case, sincerely wrong. So they're muttering, and they're grumbling, and they're watching Jesus so carefully, but deeper than all of what is happening in the moment, they're moving from interest to skepticism to jadedness to a deep grudge that's growing in their hearts. And and by the way, let's just pause. By this time, Jesus has been in this argument so many times before. Uh, Just a while before this moment, Jesus did something even more outrageous. He actually asked one of these undesirables, these sinners, a tax collector actually, to not only follow him, but to be in his inner circle and to rep him. 
It was 10 chapters earlier where we read the account in Luke 5. It's just in Luke 5, 27, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, he said to Jesus. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. Now, don't miss this. Jesus is attending a party at a lavish house and the food is amazing and all the money that Levi has to throw this party is stolen money from fellow Jewish people. So he's eating at a collaborator's house. The, the Mark and account of this reads like this in Mark 2.15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for many followed him. So can you imagine Levi's joy, this amazing person, this leader, this healer, this most respected religious guy wants to hang out with me, but, but not just hang out with me. I, though I'm disqualified and I'm a sinner, he says, I'll eat with you, but not just eat with you. I'll actually come to your home, but not just come to your home. But then he says, follow me, become my disciple, which implies that he believes I have the right and ability to do it. Ah, and then verse 30. The same scenario happens again. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? There it is again. But let me add something that's so key. Jesus always welcomed everyone and ate with anyone, but Jesus never excuses their sin. By associating with them, he just loved them. So this is critical as we think this through. Many of us as Christians believe that association means justification. It doesn't. It's like in Twitter, retweeting does not mean endorsement. So many Christians need to realize that actually just because you hang out with someone or have a relationship with someone does not mean that you're justifying what they do when it's obviously wrong. Yet many more of you that are listening to me today, and especially in our culture, they teach, you teach, that love means doing what you want or feel. No. God is creator and we are created. God defines that. See, Jesus always calls out self-righteous people and those who justify or excuse or celebrate their sin. Uh, Jesus did not care about ceremonial cleanliness, but he wanted to see heart change in everyone and he knew that would happen through holy contact. So Jesus responds to the pastors of the day and says these incredibly important words. Luke 5.31, Jesus answered them. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What is striking is that Jesus appears not to require repentance in advance of having relationships with sinners or tax collectors or religious people, but he will require repentance. See, here's what we've got to catch. If you truly encounter Jesus, you will end up repenting. Your life will change. You will be conformed to God's views and God's ways. The relationship has started, but it always has to end in change. By the way, is this saying that Jesus has only come for sinners and good for nothings and not nice people or religious people? No, 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 there's sarcasm here. Here's Jesus' point. We're all sinners. We're all lost. We're all infected by sin. Everyone needs the doctor. Another wrote this, when accused, Jesus does not dissemble or cover up. He cheerfully admits the charge. You're absolutely right. My mission is to the weak, the sick, the infirm, not the healthy. Clearly, Jesus is employing a clever rhetorical strategy. They asked, why does he eat with these people? He answered, I'm a doctor. Surely no one would deny that sick people need a doctor. But then he adds the phrase about sinners and righteous, and he ups the ante. Now the questioners and all of us must ask, well, which are we? Are we the sinners? Are we the righteous? Are we the healthy? Are we the sick? Is his statement accusational or, or comfort? See, Jesus knows that Levi and his friends and the religious leaders all need salvation. And so what Jesus is doing then and what he's literally doing at this moment is he's confronting two flagrant expressions of sin where most of us wouldn't catch it. Number one, he's saying that every single devout, kind, religious person on earth is infected with sin. He said, if you're a moralist, moralism says it's up to me. 
I get relationship with God. My medicine and how I heal myself is through my good works. I make myself he healthy. I get into heaven by what I do. I'm just fine. I'm good. I'm religious. I, I, I go to church. I, I pray five times a day. I'm, I'm mindful. I, I, I give regularly. Now see, what you're saying is I don't need help because I'm good and God likes me because of all of my actions. My personal good will outweigh my bad and that will impress God. Well, see, Jesus calls that sickness. He calls that sin because you're saying you're saving yourself. The other form of the same sickness is hedonism. I will live my life through being self-made or through pleasure, sex, money, and power, and I will define what is right and wrong about sex, money, and power, and relationships. Not God, not the Bible, me. One's about denial, the other's about non-denial, but both find their roots in our stories, our experiences, our decisions, not God's saving work through Jesus and loving his lordship. The key is that the tax collector and the scribe and the sinner are all the same. Everyone needs the doctor. Everyone needs to be healed. So why does Jesus talk with and eat with sinners? And why does he talk and eat with religious people? Well, he wants them all to be drawn back to God. So the real question is who's really lost and who's really found? Who's really sick and who's really healthy? Well, let's go back to where we started today, back to Luke 15. Jesus is having it out with another group of pastors, having the same argument. And so he responds with a parable, a story. And it reads like this in Luke 15, 3. So Jesus told them a parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? He paints a picture, by the way, that they all would know. There's a shepherd counting his sheep. He realizes he's missing one. This, by the way, is not a wealthy guy. A small herd of sheep at this time was around 200. So this is a lower middle-class person. He's the owner of the sheep. And we also know this because there's no other shepherds with him or hired hands. It's just him. So he's a small business owner. And then did you catch it? He leaves the 99. Now, why would he leave the 99 without protection? Either the shepherd is really bad at his job or something more is being shown at this moment we might be missing. Maybe, just maybe, the shepherd will risk everything, including himself and all he owns, to find this one lost sheep. And originally, all the questions would hang in the air. Well, who's the shepherd? And who's the found ones? And who's the lost sheep? And Jesus knows. The religious people in the crowd thinking, they're the shepherds. Jesus, of course, wants them and, and the sinners and the tax collectors and all of us to find ourselves in his story. But we usually end up getting our place in the story wrong. Now, to the Jewish mind, if you read the whole Old Testament, images of sheep and shepherds are everywhere. God's people historically were nomadic, and shepherding was at the center of their economics. That's why all through the Old Testament, there are all these images. God himself is called a shepherd. Psalm 81, hear a shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph, Joseph like a flock. Or Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Time and time again, God's people are called uh, sheep. Uh, Psalm 100, uh, uh, verse 3, know the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the, the sheep of his pasture. And even humanity itself, our problem with sin, our walking away, our rebellion, our spiritual sickness is tied to a sheep worldview. Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own ways. This is Jesus's point. The religious leaders, as he's speaking, would start connecting the dots. The Old Testament says we're all the one lost sheep all gone astray, not the 99. I shared this a few months ago in a few other series, but let me do it again. Most of us didn't grow up on farms or around sheep. Most of us, our experience with sheep are petting zoos, and that's about it. But if anyone who, who, who's listening or, or you know that knows about sheep will, will tell you they are such a profoundly helpful image to describe our condition. They get in trouble all the time. They wander everywhere. Many point out that they are timid, stubborn, frightened, and rebellious all at once. They're utterly defenseless, easily lost, and there are multiple accounts of sheep being so oblivious to danger, always looking for food with their head down. They walk right into burning fire or right off cliffs and they die. They can fall over all the time and can't get up. I shared this story before, let me do it again. One pastor who had also been a shepherd for years says this, even the, uh, the largest and the fattest and the strongest and healthiest sheep can become cast and become a casualty. The way it happens is like this, a heavy, fat, or long, fleece sheep will lie down comfortably in some little hollow or depression in the ground. It will roll on its side slightly to just stretch and relax and enjoy the day, and suddenly... The center of gravity in the body shifts 
So it turns on its back so it can no longer actually access the ground with its feet. Then it starts panicking, and then it begins to paw frantically, which only makes things worse. Now it's quite impossible for the sheep to even regain its feet. Now it's stuck upside down, and if someone does not come and put it back side up, it will literally die on its back. Now before any of us say, well, I'm not a sheep, really? <laughs> all of us, I think, are timid, stubborn, frightened, and rebellious all the time, going to places we should not go and getting lost. We are all sheep gone astray. So Jesus says it plainly, doesn't the shepherd leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? <clears throat> so the 99 sheep could be lost or could be stolen or eaten by wild animals, but he looks and he looks and he looks until he finds the one lost sheep. Again, God is pointing out to God's mer Jesus is pointing out to God's mercy and God's love and God's tenderness and God's care. If God, Jesus' point is, is like that shepherd, should not those that know God and supposedly represent God and preach about God and teach his word act like him? He goes after the sick. They need help or they die. He goes after the lost, not the found. Tax collectors, sinners, and lost people, right? The story continues, verse five. And when he finds the lost sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders. He carries it. He cares for it. He doesn't yell at it, you stupid sheep, you got lost again. He doesn't put a rope around it and drag it home. He bears the weight of its lostness, bears the weight on his shoulders and saves it. And when the saving is done, it says, then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Verse six, so they eat, they, they party. This is a big deal. The dots would be being connected at this moment because Jesus is basically saying to the Pharisees, the pastors of the day, I'm at the party, guys, and you're standing outside of the party. I'm celebrating with people who are starting to find their way home, and you're outside missing that they, they've been found. And then he says these words in verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. When one admits they're sinful, are in need of God's help. When they agree with God what sin is and trust not in themselves anymore, but in Jesus, that's when the celebration breaks out. This is how the same account is written in Matthew, Matthew 18, 13. And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. You're unaware, Jesus is saying, that you have the same need as the tax collector and the sinner. Jesus, not done, begins another story. He says in verse 8, at Luke 15, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Again, Jesus tells the exact same story in another way. One story was about a man. Now this story is about a woman. In other words, everyone's included in God's work. And he says a woman loses a coin. Now for us, we're like, who cares? I lose coins all the time. Some people are like, what's a coin? I, only, I don't even use cash anymore. I lose a quarter here, a loony there, a toonie there. No, no, no. This is a drachma. It's a full day's wages. These coins were not round, by the way, so they would not roll like ours do. So the woman would think it would have to be here. Now, also, most of us won't catch this. In this time period, many women in this culture wore coins as part of their headdress, as part of their dowry. So this coin was connected not just to money or a full day's wages or saving, but her ability possibly to marry within this culture. So this coin is not just worth a lot of money. It might be connected actually to her future survivability. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? We, we might not catch something at first glance. The woman's not rich. She's not powerful. She's not in charge. She's a village peasant. Now, I've, I've heard this story ever since I was a little boy. And I always presumed she had to light a lamp because it was nighttime. No, 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 no. We, we miss it. There are no windows in this house. This woman is incredibly poor. These type of houses, scholars tell us, were homes for rent based on bartering that had no access to outside light. And when the money runs out, you have no place to live. So this moment for this woman is really scary. It consumes all her time. There is real anxiety and fear here. She lights the lamp, carefully sweeping the floor because this could be rent. This could be her family savings. This could be connected to future marriage. This is catastrophic. 
Jesus is looking at the mixed crowd, sinner, tax collector, scholar, pastor. Do they get it? Do they see it? Do they understand? God is, is like this, trying to recover and reconnect with us in the same way. Do you feel the love of God and the searching of God for us? Well, it says when she finds it, verse 9, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who what? Repents. And so, as we gather in our homes all around the world, in this probably the most unusual Easter season in our lifetimes, let me encourage you, and actually for some of you, let me call you home. To you that are watching or listening who are not Christians, to you that are Christians in name only, but you've not really met God through Jesus, there, there is no profound life change in you. Hear the good news that is stronger than sickness, stronger than the loss of a job, stronger than the loss of stability, stronger even than sickness and death. You see God's heart for you here. You see God's heart and love is real. God is the good shepherd looking for you. God is like the woman searching for that coin and the coin is you. God is like the doctor walking into the most dangerous place, into our spiritual sickness and being willing to heal us. God looks for us when we're not looking, and when we're even looking, he still finds us and offers us healing that ripples into eternity. So in this time of quarantine, in this time of shuddering, in this time of isolation, in this time of sickness, God comes to you now and says, in this moment, to some of you, I've literally just found you now. And God asks you this question, are you the Pharisee? Are you the tax collector? Are you the sinner? Are you a profoundly nice, good, kind person? Moral, even religious? You give all the time to charities and you go to religious activities, but you fundamentally believe that when you die, God is going to say, well, I know you and I, I love you and I'm so impressed by you because of all the good things you did? That's sickness. That's religion. That's sin. Because that's a declaration you can save yourself. You don't need a savior because you're your savior. And God says, no, no, you're not home yet. Many others of you are, your life is marked by hedonism. I will live my life through being self-made or, or sex or money or power or whatever I deem is important. One again, like I said, is about denial. The other is about non-denial. But both find their roots in us, not in God. See, it takes another to heal us of our sin. If you're lost and cannot find a way out, someone has to come and find you. If you're laying on your back and you can't get back up, someone, the shepherd, has to turn you around. If you're critically ill, it takes a doctor to give you healing when your body cannot heal itself. And this is the point. The tax collector and the scribe and the sinner are all the same. You are the lost sheep. You are the lost coin. You are the one in need of a doctor, but you need to admit your loss to be found. You need to admit your sick to be healed. R remember what Jesus said. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing over one sinner who repents. God is inviting you at this moment to know him, to find purpose in this life, to never be alone again, even in isolation. He'll be with you to give you forgiveness and eternal life, but you must repent, turn away, admit that self-trust is wrong. Admit that your trust in your religious activities or your, your kind activities are actually not enough. And others of you need to repent of breaking God's laws. Maybe you've not heard this before, but this might be helpful to all of us. Confessing means you agree with God's point of view, not yours. Confession means I agree with God on this point, And repentance means you turn from that thing that is wrong. And God is inviting all of us, but especially if you've never met him, to confess sin, self-reliance, and repent so you can be brought home. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in a minute, but before I do that, I'd like to speak to the many, many of you that are genuine followers of Jesus watching in this Easter season during this global pandemic. Uh, this week, I've been talking to my friends in New York City who are living at the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. 
and uh, they are trying to lead congregations in a very difficult time. And one of my good friends there posted a poem written, I believe, by someone in the city, living through it now, and when I read it, I went, oh, this poem is going to help us understand what God's trying to do in us as Christians in this Easter season, in this moment. Let me just read the poem to you. We've all been exposed, not necessarily to the virus, maybe, who knows, but we've all been exposed by the virus. Corona is exposing us, exposing our weak sides, exposing our dark sides, exposing what normally lays far beneath the surface of our souls, hidden by the invisible masks we wear, now exposed by paper masks we can't hide far enough behind. Corona is exposing our addiction to comfort, our obsession with control, our compulsion to hoard, and our protection of self. Corona is peeling back our layers, tearing down our walls, revealing our illusions, leveling our best-made plans. Corona is exposing the gods we worship, our health, our hurry, our sense of security, our favorite lies, our secret lusts, our, mis our misplaced trust. Corona is calling everything into question. What is a church without a building? What is my worth without an income? How do we plan without certainty? How do I love despite risk? Corona, she writes, is exposing me. My mindless numbing, my endless scrolling, my careless words, my fragile nerves. We've all been exposed. Our junk laid bare, our fears made known, the band-aids torn, the masquerade done. So what now? What's left? Clean hands, clear eyes, tender hearts. What corona reveals God can heal? Come, Lord Jesus, and have mercy on us. There are three things I want to encourage you to do today or this week if you're a Christian living in this really scary moment. Number one, out loud, today I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to say to God the Father, <clears throat> through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, I trust you and I do declare that you're good. You are my good shepherd. You are good. Fifteen years ago in churches, we used to sing a song, you know, you give and you take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. It's really easy to sing things like that when everything's fine. But it's true. And by the way, you'll notice I said, say it out loud. Literally declare, I trust you, God. You are good no matter what happens. Number two, that poem was really helpful because it also exposes a lot of the sin that's coming out of us. So also, maybe you need to take some time to say, forgive me for all the things I've placed in front of you or beside you, God, that I've trusted in that now I see that I didn't see before. In other words, during times of crisis, not only is our true character revealed, but also so is hidden, unknown idolatry. And so I would encourage you genuinely as a Christian for your freedom, for your joy, for your deeper walk with God, to say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what things actually were idols in my life, like hurry or, or hoarding or control, and say to the Lord, forgive me. I want to be even more holy in this season, not less. But let me end with encouragement. I just want to declare to you, <clears throat> whoever you are listening to me today, that if you're a Christian you are already found and you are loved. You are the found sheep already. You already are a found coin. You're firmly in the grasp of God's hand. It was Paul who wrote this, and I want to read it over you so you know the truth, no matter what takes place. Romans 8.38, For I am convinced that neither death or life angels or demons, the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height or depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God 
that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let's just take a moment <clears throat> to pray together, wherever you might be, whatever living room or bedroom or whatever device you're watching on, let's just pray. For we who are Christians, Lord, number one, we want to say out loud, you're good. We trust you. And you are our rock. You are our good shepherd. And we just acknowledge that. Father and Son, send the Holy Spirit across our church, but all churches, to speak individually and then to us as churches about idols we didn't even know about or we did know about. Help us to repent and be free of that. Uh, Lord, thank you for the truth that we are never separated from the love of God that is found in Jesus Christ. Life, death, present, future, no matter we are found. And I pray because the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, that the Holy Spirit would comfort us at this moment supernaturally and we'd know we will never be separated from that love. And by the way, if you have never actually embraced Jesus, I want to invite you in this moment to do it. So again, just say, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm the tax collector, or uh, I'm the sinner, or, or I'm the, the religious person, the Pharisee. And just tell him which one you are, or a mix of them. And say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my self-trust. Or I'm sorry for my law-breaking. Or I'm sorry for my stealing. Or I'm sorry for making my rights, or my worldview, or my experiences the be-all and end-all. I can't save myself. I can't heal myself. So Jesus, forgive me my sin. I believe you lived. You actually died. You physically rose from the dead. That you are Savior and Lord. I want you to save me. I want purpose in my life. I want eternal life. I confess. I agree with your view. And I repent. I turn from those things and now ask for you to give me your Holy Spirit to move inside of me to make me new. And I want to have uh, life. I don't want fear to have the final say. I don't even want death to have the final say. I want you to have the final say. So I pray this for the first time in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to encourage you, continue to, during this time of fear, to have faith in the middle of it. Be strong, be responsible, uh, be honest, and know that you are deeply loved by God in this time.